well since my baby left me. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Guitar Cast. I'm your host, Andy Keithley, and today I'm talking with Matt Axton. Matt and I talked a lot about his dad, Hoyt Axton, who was a country songwriter and folk singer and uh, wrote songs that went on to become hits for he and other artists like Greenback Dollar, The Pusher, The No-No Song, Joy to the World, Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. Never been to Spain, Bony Fingers, and a lot more. And uh, he was also an actor in the 70s and 80s in uh, movies and TV. He was in Duke's Hazard, I Dream of Jeannie, Bonanza, Different Strokes, Dallas. He was in Gremlins. And we also talk a little bit about Matt's grandmother and Hoyt's mother, Mae Axton, who was a promoter and songwriter in early Nashville music industry days. She co-wrote Elvis Presley's first hit single, Heartbreak Hotel, and earned the title of Queen Mother of Nashville for her work with artists like Elvis, Willie Nelson, Reba McIntyre, Blake Shelton, Mel Tillis, lots more. And we also talk about Matt and his solo career, and uh, we play a few songs in there. So hope you like it. Please enjoy my conversation with Matt Axton. Uh, welcome, man. Thank you very much, Andy. This is this is awesome. A little secret El Segundo spot. Yeah, we met what, <laughs> a couple months ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Through some mutual friends, we jammed a little bit. Yep, I came to I, I came to test my skills with the pros like you guys. You know, <laughs> yeah. show off a little bit. Yeah, man. So we played some of your originals. And some of your dad's songs. Yeah, drop some legacy bombs. That was, that was funny because Greg didn't know. I thought Greg knew all that stuff, you know, about like the the deep legacy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, oh, yeah, never. He's like, oh, never been Spain. That's cool. I was like, yeah, my dad wrote it. He's like, what? What are you talking about? I was like, oh. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about your dad and your grandmother. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then about you and your original music and kind of what you're up to these days. Yeah. So your dad, Hoyt Axton. Yes. Country songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. Just general, general artistic bumpkin. Uh huh. He was an you actor know. too, right? Yeah. So he fell into the acting stuff. I, truthfully, all the acting that he did came from music. You know, someone saw him play live and was like, hey, man, I got a part for you. I want to write you into this. Like hop on Bonanza or hop on I Dream of Genie or whatever. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Thing was coming up. So it all it all centered through the music part, you know. Okay. And what are some of the songs that he's known for writing? So I mean, if I go back to the first one, you know, so he was an Okie, right? And he came out here, was part of the folk scene in San Francisco in the early sixties. And he wrote his his first hit was a, a song called A Greenback Dollar. It's like, I don't give a damn about a greenback dollar. And that was a big hit for a band called the Kingston Trio. Mm -hmm. And so when that sort of was a little hit, my dad's like, I want to go to, you know, Hollywood and L.A. and hop in the deep end, you know, and moved down here what in the mid 60s and sort of got in with that Laurel Canyon scene, you know, that whole crew. You know, my dad was a mainstay at the Troubadour and I mean, which is the only the last venue that still exists from that era. You know, Pretty much, yeah. But he was the guy, you know, he said whenever somebody like canceled a show, they called my dad and he would jump in the car and come down there and at least at least fill out a set and, you know, and yell real loud and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, but yeah, so Greenback Dollar was his first sort of big hit. Um, and and just like a perfect Hollywood story, he didn't sign the right paperwork and never made really a dime off that song. Oh, man. But the chorus of that song is, I don't give a damn about Greenback Dollar. I like that. So at a principal, he's like, well, I can't really whine about that. You know, he's like, live and learn. You know, <laughs> you know he does stories like, he's like, I was pulling up in like my beat up jalopy, pulling up to my producer's ha- mansion in the hills with like Ferraris. He's like, there's something weird here. <laughs> I don't like this, you know. So <laughs> but either way, right, like I said, that was a, it's a very Hollywood story. Um, and then he had a couple the little hits. His biggest one uh, later was Joy to the World, right? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Right. That was the big one. That was the big number one hit for, what, six weeks on number one and, you know, was... Uh, you know, almost got the song of the year, all that kind of stuff. Either way, it's a very uh, 
impactful. People still know that one Absolutely, nowadays. Yeah. Right? It's a great premise too. Joy to the world. You can't go wrong, you know, even though people always sort of confuse it with the Christmas one, which is funny right. and, and makes sense. But I'm like, no, the song about <laughs> the frog. Write, he, didn't he didn't write, write that, that one. one. <laughs> no, I wish he wrote that That's one. Funny, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would be different. Christmas song. That's where the money is. Any other Christmas <laughs> song. Um, so that was his biggest one. But at the same time, he probably, you know, I mean, if, if you want me to do like the, the list, you know, probably the top five. So yeah, Joy of the World was the biggest one, right? He did Never Been to Spain, which was Three Dog Night as well. Had a good little hit. And that one, ironically, is probably covered by more people, you know, just because it's an easier, fun, you know, three chords. Straight ahead, and, yeah, yeah. Straight ahead, fun, rocky one. Um, you know, I think Elvis did it, share. I mean, a lot of people had little mini hits with that one. And then he had a song called The No-No Song, which Ringo right. had a big hit with back in the 70s. And, uh, you know, on and off, my dad had his own share, probably like a dozen, 15 of his own sort of hits that landed somewhere on the charts, you know, back in the day. Mostly like the country and the country pop, you know, charts and stuff. Because even though he started folk, he went pretty, went hit more heavier country, you know, and later on in his career. Because like I said, he was the Oki, you know, so it was pretty natural. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, and so he was... So your grandmother, right, mm. his mother, May Axton, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who is known as the Queen Mother of Nashville. Yes, true. That's a pretty heavy title. <laughs> how, how did, who is she and who, how did she earn that, that title? So she was, uh, at the time, when my dad was growing up, my grandma, was, she was a PR person, you know. Um, she worked with, with Hank Snow and some older acts. And, you know, she just dabbled in the songwriting, wasn't heavy in it, but, you know, sort of knew the industry and knew the people and just really loved sort of supporting artists and, you know, the people that were trying to grind to make art, you know, music, more or less. And she, she knew Colonel Tom Parker, sort of that, that sort of Southeast crew of people. And uh, she's actually one of the people that introduced Elvis to Colonel Tom Parker. So Elvis at the time was like building up a little momentum you know doing his little sort of pop pop stuff over there and my grandma like I said she was sort of boosting up people and helping them and she told Elvis she's like you know what well she asked Elvis like what do you want out of this he's like all I want to do May is buy my mama house she's like all right well you need a hit song so I'm gonna write you a hit song and then you can buy your mama house right and I'm sure she told that to a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> but she happened to tell that to Elvis Aaron Presley and one day my grandma was sitting with Glenn Reeves, who was a you know an, another old sort of folky country songwriter guy. They're sitting in my grandma's living room, and they're you know thumb through newspapers and articles, anything to get like inspiration for tunes. And they opened the paper, and there was this article about a guy who had sadly taken his own life and took all the the identification off his body, like his ID and anything, right? And, and, and took his life, and then things. And all he had was a note that said, I walk a lonely street. That's what he left in his pocket, right? And that was this little article, this little blurb. And they said, in 22 minutes, my grandma and this guy named Tommy Durden basically finished this song, right? So they sort of started, and in 22 minutes, it was done. And that became Heartbreak Hotel, which was Elvis's first major hit, first million-selling hit, yeah. basically. And at that time that that was happening, you know, she obviously became good friends with Elvis and was part of, you know, started having some weight behind her, right? And people were starting to seek her out. My dad would come home from, <laughs> he would say, come home from football practice, make himself a triple-decker peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and sort of hide in the kitchen when, when my grandma and Elvis or whoever was, like, talking music. And he's, my dad's like, I really want to do that. That sounds like fun, right? So he went to the Navy for a stint and then, like I said, got in the car and made his way to San Francisco in the early 60s, and sort of the rest was history after that. So... So as far that's my dad's little tangent off of that. But my grandma also started sort of, like I said, supporting more musicians and moved to Nashville and became the queen mother of Nashville by basically being the conduit to through, you know, struggling people, struggling artists and sort of the labels in the industry. And she supported and started almost anybody who was anybody in the industry, even nowadays, you know, all the the Garths and the Rebas and the Willies and, you know, anybody uh, sort of went through my grandma at some point, you know, and she, and she, the rest of her life, she kept up the PR stuff and she was my dad's, you know, main mouthpiece and like supporter and, and, you know, was really big in that. And that enabled my dad to just sort of be 
himself, you know, and do his yeah. things and focus on the art and, and just have fun. And she took care of all the business and the PR stuff. And it was a, you know, it worked, right? It worked, you know. And and my job now is to try and sort of keep their legacies alive and try and keep good music going and 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 push it and do it the right way. I'm not saying I'm perfect at that, but I'm trying. Of course. Right? You know, I'm trying. That's cool, man. So when she was uh, guiding a young Elvis Presley, was that in Nashville or was that in Oklahoma? I think that was actually in Florida. They were in like oh, Jacksonville okay. area when that was happening. Okay. You know, so I don't know. Yeah, the, the Oklahoma part, my, my dad was born in Oklahoma. But they moved around a lot. My, my, my grandma May, she was actually a school teacher, you know, so was, she did all this stuff on the side. You yeah, know, all the PR stuff, <laughs> all the song. Wrote a couple everlasting country yeah, hits on exactly. the side. Just like, oh my god, I got fifteen minutes here. What can we do? You That's know? crazy, man. <laughs> but yeah, so mostly like Jacksonville, then then sort of migrated up to Nashville was the main thing. She lives in a town, Hendersonville, outside of Nashville. But you know, as a kid, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, if, number one, Nashville has like sort of a feel. You know, it's like humid, hot. There's this smell to everything there. Like as a kid, you know, I remember going on my dad's tour bus, and we'd always pull in there, and it was just like see the fireflies and like uh, everything was so like so like weird and visceral as a kid you know he's just like whenever i go yeah. there i can just rem- takes me back immediately you know so what was what was your um you know like personal memories from some of those interactions and and like you said on the tour bus and traveling with your dad yeah so i would hop on his tour bus you know him writing those songs enabled him I said earlier to sort of have his own mini career underneath that, right? The songwriting is what made the big bucks, but he, like I said, he had a he toured, you know, 365 for my whole life growing up. And my mom actually was his piano player slash you know band leader for growing up, so it was pretty natural. Right, anytime there was, uh, you know, it was a holiday or there was no school, I was hopping on a bus and we were traveling all over the world, basically. Obviously not on the bus all over the world, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so we got to go to Europe a couple of times. And as a kid, you know, I just thought it was normal. I thought everybody did that, you know. I mean, it was just, you know, it's funny because my a lot of people ask me, like, you know, what music did you listen to? Or like, what, you know, I was like, well, we didn't listen to music. Music just was, you know. It was just what happened every day. It was everywhere. You just made it. Exactly. It was just, yeah. there was always musicians and quirky people around all the time, just, you know, creating art and creating music. So it was pretty natural to like just sort of absorb some of that somehow, you know. And my dad always believed that he was sort of the satellite dish, you know. He was the transmitter and the songs were in the cosmos and it would come down to him. And it was his job to put it to paper, you know, and get it out there. But that that's, that, that art is just out there, you know, somewhere. And I believe that too, you know. Did you... um you know, interact with, uh, I would imagine he was on tour with other artists, other country artists coming up in the seventies, right? Sixties, seventies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any cool stories about, you know, meeting some of these giants? Well, it's, you know, it's funny cause so I came back, back a little later in my dad's career, you know? Uh, so my, my brothers and sisters who are quite a bit older than me, they were in like the meat of that stuff, you know, um, where I was a young kid when he was, you know, hitting that height. So, I wasn't nearly as like aware of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, but I remember, you know, we got to do the Grand Old Opry a few times, and I got to hop on stage. And I remember, back, you know, backstage there's all the, the forever heavy hitters of that scene, you right. know, hanging out. And and because of my grandma's connection, because it was the double whammy, you know, it was just they're all family in a weird way, you know. Yeah. So I remember every whenever we were on tour, it'd be like, the one I do remember, my dad's like, oh my god, Merle, Merle's house is around the street. Let's just go. So just pull up in our bus to Merle Haggard's house, and I was just like. You know, they're just hanging out, you know, just, just drinking a beer, doing what we're doing, you know, and it's just like that would happen quite often, you know, go to, I was like, oh, Peter Fonda's over here or, you know, wh- Johnny Cash, whatever, right? It was just, that's what happened. Did you ever meet Johnny Cash? <laughs> uh, I did. I, oh, I did a couple of times when I was a little, very little, yeah. you know, but, but I remember my mom always tells the story, you know, that, you know, when his movie came out, Johnny Cash, well, that was like 10 years ago now, right? We're watching it and my mom's like, oh yeah, I've been there. I was like, what do you mean? So she's like, oh yeah, oh, that piano, I played that piano. Oh, yeah, we'd go to parties there all the time and just hang out and jam and stuff. And I was like, you know, I didn't even know all that stuff, you know, because obviously, like I said, I was a little kid. But but it, it, like I said, there was just, it was a tight-knit group, even though they were sort of separated. My dad was a West Coast guy, right? That He was L.A., but all his tours were mainly sort of Northwest, and then he'd do that big sort of all the way out to, you know, Nashville and back loop, one yeah. of his main tours, you know. Not as much up in the, in the high east. It, every once in a while he would, you know, but... 
And was he playing, you know, his well-knowns, his hits? Was he putting a lot of new stuff in there, trying out stuff, a little both? Yeah, exactly. It was a little both. I mean, all, you know, yeah. you always got to give the crowd what they want, right? You got to play the hits. There's always some joy of the world, never been to Spain, and all, the, all those good yeah. stuff. But Bony fingers. Yeah, and another yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, that was his, one of his biggest, you yeah. know, hits. And, you know, made it up like four or five on the country charts back in the day, you know, type thing. But... But, but, you know, I mean, it's, I call it a curse sometimes, the acts and songwriting curse. You know, there's just way too many dang songs, you know, which, is, like I said, is boo-hoo, you know. But, <laughs> but you know, you always got to, and, and I think most artists usually progress and, and you know, ups and down, ebb and flow, right? You know, like you're going to, in the 70s, everybody did a bunch of weird stuff and their art, art got all tripped out and fun, you know. And then in the 80s, they were all coming down off of it, you know. And the 90s was the, what I consider, you know, like the the dark sobriety years, right? Everyone was all bummed out, you know, coming off of yeah. it. Yeah. That's where you get all the grunge and all that stuff, right? It's you know? true. <laughs> you know, but yeah, you're always, you're always testing some new ones, keeping the old faithfuls in there. Yeah. And at that point, like I said, it was, it was such a different industry back then for like a, a person nowadays who was sort of on my dad's level of like fame and stuff, you know, they're playing one show a week. You know, one big show a week, and they're going on private planes, private jets, and amazing tour buses, and eating private chefs. Right? It's a whole different world. And where th my dad, they were, like I said, he was on the road 365, and they were doing two shows a night, six nights a week, and then just hopping 12 people on a little tour bus and hopping. You know, it's a different grind. Yeah. But that's, I think, that's why all that great music came out of that era, as those people were living that. You know, they were. I mean, when you get to practice and live with the people you're practicing with, mm -hmm. you get tight, right? You get to hop on a different wavelength of people, you know? And then, I mean, we were just talking about it before this, you know, how like you'd love to be able to practice more with the people and yeah. get tighter, you know, and change your sets up and test yourself and yeah. all that fun stuff. Yeah, know? I've got the opposite problem. <laughs> <laughs> You know? Man, oh, that's that's amazing. You were based in Tahoe for a long time, right? That's kind of where you grew yeah, up. Yeah, I was born and raised up there. So my dad would do, you know, L.A. would be sort of the the TV and like heavy music stuff. You know, I mean, the industry is obviously down here. You know, and then he'd go to Na tour, and then Nashville would be sort of more of the country centered stuff, and then Tahoe would be sort of the the tip of the the triangle, right? And Tahoe is where he would go. He always had a place where he'd go, you know, take a breath and relax and get inspired, you know. Yeah, and, it's a good place. And do that stuff. You know, I think at one point he was up in Oregon for a big chunk of time and on like Crested Butte. And it was always something somewhere in the natural, yeah. you know. Um, so I was born and raised in Lake Tahoe, which, you know, when I was born and he moved there in the 60s and 70s, it was a, a amazing place to be, you know. It yeah, was, I, I could imagine uh, that you have witnessed Tahoe go from like untouched unknown place to like now it's it's a little overrun it's a little and it's weird because it's over it's not overrun in like amount of people it's overrun in the type of people that are there. yeah you know back then there was a it was an amazing sense of community like you know it was an, an artistic place you know people it you, even though we're in california it's an escape you feel like you're in a different world and even though it's only a couple hours from the bay you know like i said you're you don't feel like you're around people or around near a city you know, well, it's high up. It's yeah, it's up there. Like I mean, we had that giant snowstorm a couple weeks ago, and all I did was shovel for like five days straight. <laughs> My shovel muscles are strong, you know. But that is also that lifestyle. You know, there's a little, totally. it's like a little bit of a grind. It's worth it. It's beautiful. One of the most beautiful places in the world. I'm biased, but I've been to a lot of places in the world, and there are beautiful places. But I love Tahoe. Tahoe is very unique, you know, yeah. for that stuff. But yes, and so it has changed in the fact that uh, sort of like. LA where the biggest and nicest properties and houses are nobody lives in them you know they're like they're not, before there was a lot of full-time residents and then some people had second homes from the bay you know and now it's pretty much all third and fourth homes it's all investment properties and yeah you know a lot of people moved out there during covid tons of people yeah. tons of people which was great because it injected a little new blood you know like this I guess the school system got a bunch of new kids it's great but then it also the property average property value would just like skyrocketed. You know, before it was already sort yeah. of ridiculously expensive and now it like doubled to be ludicrously expensive, yeah. which that does put a strain on uh, the workforce. Like the reality is there's just not people that, that working class can't afford to live up there. And there's a big problem. It's weird. I mean, that's just my super Tahoe tangent, but yeah, I said, like, so <laughs> well, I, mean, I was born and raised there. So I got to, I've seen this cycle and it's, and it's like I said, it's always been a resort town. That's where the bread and butter is. Yeah. 
but it is just in the last like five to ten years it has just flipped to a not not a, a place that can last in a lot of ways and which is sad but nobody can buy the lake so we'll always <laughs> have you that go. we'll always have that <laughs> Well, you want to get into some music? Yes, let's do it. What do you feel like playing? <clears throat> hmm. Well, I was going to say, you know, we were talking about doing sort of the one song from each generation, you know. That yeah. That would be a good idea. But we can, we can just go over it real quick if you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we'll do, um, we can start with Heartbreak Hotel. That one's easy, right? We'll just do it in the blues, and, you know, knee. E. My baby left me, found a place to dwell Down the end, a lonely street at Heartbreak Hotel Will you, you'd be so lonesome You'd be so lonesome You could cry, 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 cry You'd be so lonesome You'd be so lonesome You could die Although it's always crowded, still can find some room for broken hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom. Well, you be so lonesome, you be so lonesome, you can cry, 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 cry. You be so lonesome, you be so lonesome, you can die. So long on lonely street, I'll never, never, never go back. You be so lonesome, you be so lonesome, you could cry. In 22 minutes. Yeah, man. And it's funny because it's, it's the same thing with Joy to the World, right? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. My dad was a, you know, he was a signed artist at that time. He had a couple, you know, like I said, he was grinding. He was a mid, mid major artist, known much more for the songwriting part. You know, people would come to him for the songs. But like I said, he still had his own little career and had his, definitely was growing that following in LA and stuff. Because um, like I said, he grinded, you know, he grinded, which is great. You know, I, that's what I'm trying to do down here. Absolutely. the grinding part, right? But he was he was doing an album and he had some studio time and they had finished the session was done, and they still had like twenty minutes right and and my dad's bass player at the time this guy named Ar Arnie Moore was like well don't just like let this go to waste and my dad's like well, I don't have anything and he's like what about that song you started writing or the other day and my dad's like well there's no words to it you know I had the you know the other 
had like the a riff to it. It was a lot slower, like, dun, 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 you know. And the guy's like, and my dad's like, well, okay, I'll just write some fake lyrics. I'll just yeah. Jerry Moss <laughs> Frog was good for him, like just some filler lyrics, yeah, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and they just did it. And at the time, my dad just had a little like you know a cassette or eight track going to do like rough recording, so he could remember stuff, right? And my dad was shooting pool with a bunch of guys in Three Dog Night at my dad's house. They're shooting pool, and in the background, my dad on the tape player just had this rough of Joy of the World going on. And the, everyone, they all stopped and like, "What is that?" And he's like, uh, don't, uh, "Don't worry, it's like a fake song. It's not a thing." They're like, <laughs> "No, no. Uh, well, we need material for our new album. Can we use that?" And it's like, "No. Like, let me write lyrics for it, please." And they're like. Okay, and they recorded it, and six weeks later, it was the number one song in the country. Yeah, right. So it's so funny <laughs> that like you can grind for years and get so deep and like have a million chords. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, do all that. But both my grandma and dad's biggest hits were the most natural ones, ones that came off the top of their head, connected the easiest. You know, like, yeah. It's not about how deep or crazy it is. It's not how many chords. It's how you hit them. No, you know? that's a good point. And and for yeah, I, I write a little bit. And, and I have original music, but it hasn't been my main thing in a long time. But I think for anybody who's writing, I know I do this. I tend to get into this headspace where I'm writing a song and I'm like, this has to be the best song that's ever been written. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. What am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the whole point is like, write a song, bang it out, get it done. Because I fall into this trap, which I know is not uncommon, where... I'm just working on a song and working on it and working on it. And then I put it down and then I come back to it and I'm working on it and it's never quite done. But, the, <clears throat> but then you have these songs like that, which become these monumental pieces of American culture. And they're just sort of like an afterthought. Or yeah, yeah or just the initial thought. Or the, yeah. right, right, exactly. It's, it's sort of just, hey, let's just put an idea that, down and people respond to it. And it's like, that's cool. There's no need to go and change that or no need to you know, turn it into this poetic, meaningful thing. Yeah, like, what does that What does that even mean? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Yeah, and, right. <laughs> it was like, uh, uh, <laughs> and my dad says, like, I did a lot of drugs in the 60s. <laughs> it sounds cool, though. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, Everybody knows it. When you say that, everyone knows, you know. It works. And like I said, it's the best song about a frog, especially with the drinking problem that anyone's mm. ever written. Yeah. You know, but, but I couldn't agree more about finishing it. The thing is, like, once, once you finish it, even if it's just super rough, you can always go back and sift through and, and, and take stuff out and put stuff in, you know? But at least right. you have your A, B, and C in order, you know? I mean, uh, this is a soft brag. Like, I have over 300 songs, right? One of them has to be good. That's my yeah. pitch. That's my pitch <laughs> it's down true. here. Right? Uh, hopefully, we'll, I'll show one later. Hopefully, that'll be a good one. Yeah. You know, but, but it is, you know, and there's some that I've started 10 years ago and still aren't fully done. You yeah, know, that's my but, style too. But, but you know, people always ask when it comes to like songwriting too, like how do you do it? Is it do you have the chords first? Do you have the words first? Like what do you do? And truthfully, it's all over the place. Yeah, you know, each each thing, you know, you attack it differently. You know, sometimes it's just like, oh, this is a cool little story. Oh my god, that could be a song. Or like, oh, that's a fun little riff. Oh my god, what 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 a little event just happened. Okay, let's write something about that. You know, and that I think that's one thing. Obviously, I got some legacy and blood about that and I was exposed to that a lot so I might be a, a little that part's easier for me I think you know which is good and that's why I'm trying to keep it alive you know it's yeah I don't want to let that go to waste um you know but at the same time the idea with the good songs are the ones that are sort of commonly connected you know I mean you want something that uh, you know, my dad always said the best joy that he ever got in his life was thinking of you know some kid in the Cambodian jungle with the basket on his head, singing "Joy to the World," you know, walking through like just the fact that music can sort of cross, you know, race and genres and oceans and and yeah. you know, it's universal. You know, good music is universal, you know. And I always believe, especially songwriting, like do what the song wants, you know. Mm -hmm. Like don't try and don't try and get too deep, overthink it. Just go with it, and and you can polish it up later. But just yeah, and and every wants. lyric means something different to every listener. So if if I get hung up on this lyric has to mean what I mean it to mean. And I've got to rewrite it and, and shape this so that it lands and, and wraps up this story that I'm telling with a nice little bow. Well, I'm going through all this trouble to make something make sense when at the end of the day, every listener is going to interpret it completely differently <laughs> yeah. anyway. So why not just put some words on a page 
and there's your song. But sometimes it is, you know, sometimes there are deep ones, you know, like I said, like I know my songs are some that are meant to be deep and a story, you know, like have this beginning, middle and end and wrap it up. And there's some, you know, whenever I write like a funk songs and stuff, it's like, no, just say like, <laughs> yeah, there, you know, just like, you know, this is, this is meant to be danced to and rocked out to. It's not supposed to be blown anybody's mind, you yeah, know? Yeah. And it's funny because I've been doing a lot of these singer songwriter circles down here, uh, you know, and like open mic little thingies. And it's so funny because, Every, everybody is just trying to pour their soul. Everyone's right. so deep and so melancholy. And like, after watching 30 people do that, sort of they're on the same key, it's the same thing about how life's terrible and sucks and dark, <laughs> especially in COVID times, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah. you get it. Yeah. Everyone's been stewing, you know, and getting real deep. But it's like, my job, every one of those, I'm always like, well, now I have to do a happy song. Like, s- s- music is supposed to be fun sometimes, yeah. people. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> we all are bummed out. I get it, but... Here, more let's... more so in times like this. Yeah, right. You know? And it's funny because, you know, I mean, it it seems also to get the biggest reaction. <laughs> you don't want to do just do like a fun country sure. song. Everyone's like, oh, my God, yay. Like I can cl- tap my foot, like not crying anymore. You know? Right. <laughs> and that's supposed to, you know, that is one of the music is the closest thing to magic. I feel like in the world. It I really agree. Is, yeah. You know. What kind of guitar is that? Rock bridge. It's, it's really bright. I mean, that's a cool. It's cool a great talented. guitar. This is uh, it, it was two guys building these. I think now there's four total in the company. They're based out of Charlottesville, Virginia, which mm. is my hometown. No, oh. and they're making the best guitars. Really? Yeah, that's funny. You know, because I've never, I've always, my dad would get guitars all the time. You know, and and as a kid, I never want. I really didn't plan on being a musician. Per se, you know, I was always much more like I said, music was always around, as everyone did, you know, and I was much more in sort of sports and stuff. And I was, I was going to play football. I was supposed to go to OU. I went out there and did the whole thing, playing football, you know. And uh, then I ended up staying in Tahoe for a girlfriend that we broke up right after that. I mean, (laughs) changed my life forever, you know. But in a weird way, I mean, cosmically, it's good, you know. I mean, who knows? I mean, I might have been a big deal and stuff like, but I definitely wouldn't have pushed music like you know i have and, it's, it's really yeah. interesting that you know you were surrounded by so you were so deep in the thick of like musical you know the the, the country music american music vein and you're like i, I really like playing football like, yeah <laughs> i like sports yeah i was like because so, somebody who somebody's out there growing up in a football family who's like i just want to play my guitar <laughs> man. You know? yeah exactly but and like i said it was sort of inevitable i think you know the fact that then I ended up like destroying my knee playing playing basketball one time while drunk and wrestling with the buddy. Then playing basketball, and that's when I started playing guitar. I got serious. I was you know I was laid up for three months, and I picked up the guitar and got sort of serious with it. And I really started writing and being like, oh my god, this is number one. This is it was really easy. <laughs> you know, it was like came pretty natural. I was like, yeah. okay, cool. And then the song starts coming, and all my friends were like picked it up at the same time, and they can't even like do one chord. And uh, I was like writing songs, and I was like. Oh my God! Maybe I should keep doing this. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I still, I still play basketball all the time. That's the only, that's the only other thing that keeps me sane. You know. But I always tell everyone, I was like, well, my life is filled with play. I get to play music and play basketball. I was like, yeah, all right, ain't, the ain't too bad. You know. I feel the um, same way. But, but the hope is that, uh, like I said, one of those songs can connect enough that I can maybe make a living doing it and stay down here. Because I moved down here right when the pandemic happened. You moved. I said, I came, I grinded in Tahoe doing the music, doing the singer songwriter, you know, event stuff and bar gigs and all that stuff. And eventually saved up enough dough to come down here. And I was like, I'm doing it, going to Hollywood, jumping in the deep end, seeing what I can do. And I was literally right. (laughs) My first, you know, because it takes a couple months to get gigs, right? To show face and be like, okay, I'm okay. I'm a nice guy and I know how to carry a tune. I mean, at least I know how to carry a tune. I don't know about the nice guy part. <laughs> but, you know, and they're like, cool, I got three gigs. And it was like that Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday of the week that everything shut down. So I didn't even get a chance. Like, I had my flag up. I was ready to, like, slam it in the ground. I was like, oh, no, never mind. Oh, my yeah. God. You know, so, and obviously that's been, what, two years now, almost two years. But I got to go to Tahoe, you know, like my dad. And I got to go catch a breath and focus on this and figure out really what, how I wanted to attack this. And I finally, I've just started getting the more professional business side of the stuff down. I have like, you know, a, a manager and, you know, some PR people and like stuff, stuff is moving in the right way. I mean, you have to do it. Like so that's my, that's what my dad did, right? He had my grandma and he had a team behind him 
to enable him to focus on his art and push that. And that's my dream. Obviously, he had millions of dollars and you know decades of fame on his side, <laughs> you know. But I, I I hope that I can pull the good stuff from his legacy and my grandma's legacy and and use that to you know change the world a little bit and and maybe someday buy a new Prius or something. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a modern country song yeah, yeah. waiting to be written <laughs> right there. My Prius. <laughs> What else we got? What, music-wise? Yeah. Okay, well, let me thumb through the songbook slap. <laughs> uh, uh, let's do a, a speaking of Never Been to Spain. Let's do that one. That's easy. Three chords and the truth. Sure. Uh, remind me the chords real quick. No, you got to figure them out. <laughs> I can do that, too. <laughs> C's, G's, and D's. C's, I, I know. I got D's. all those. <laughs> all right, well, enough talk. Let's rock. Yeah. behind that song i don't know the, the story behind, i don't know you know like I, said, I feel like that was just sort of off the cuff nothing too deep about that one you know yeah. um yeah really <laughs> truthfully i don't that's, like i came around late my sister and brother who were you know i was on tour with them all the time right but they were like i said, grew up in his heyday like the meat of it you know they were living down here with him during my oldest brother um mark who was he was on the production side of stuff. He worked for like um, Spielberg and 
he was not a musical guy at all, no musical bone, but definitely was background production stuff. He was telling me a story recently about, he's like, oh yeah, when we were living in Laurel Canyon, uh, you know that Echoes in the Canyon, right? Came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they mentioned my dad. They do a Hoyt action drop in there, you know, talking about him, about the Troubadour days and stuff. And my brother, I recently talked to him, and he was like, oh, yeah, the Echoes in the Canyon thing. He's like, he's like, I remember that. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I was a little kid, and we would every day. He's like, every day, Dylan and the Eagles, and they'd come over. They'd hang out. Like We'd wake up, and they'd just be hanging out in the living room. You know, he's like, that was just part of like that was life, you know, that whole group of people. And that's why so much great music came out of there. I think like the, you know, they all supported each other and competed and pushed each other to be better musicians and, and write better songs and stuff, you know? Yeah. So, so I don't know like the deep part of never been to Spain, but I imagine, you know, it came from just simply being around good music and good people, you know, made a yeah. simple, good song, you know, that hit. And obviously, Three Dog Night had a hit with that one too, and they already had Joy of the World, so it was sort of a natural little connection, you know. Yeah, I always think about how what the role of the songwriter has been throughout music history, and that time that sounds like your dad was like right in the prime time of. There were a ton of the ton of songwriters. You could really make a living writing songs, and other artists would record those songs. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of that happens today. Yeah. And there are like uh, another one of my favorites that comes to mind is John Hartford, who was a Nashville guy r- writing songs. He wrote Glenn Campbell's big hit Gentle on My Mind. Mm. And he himself had very little like, you know, uh, radio yeah. play, but he wrote all these songs that, that other people would record and just a prolific songwriter and his own records are incredible. And he sort of had this like after the fact cult following. Mm. Yeah. But nowadays, it really feels like uh, that songwriter being recorded by another artist, I don't think that's happening as much. That was really in the DNA of music for a long time. Mm-hmm. You, you look at the, pick up any random vinyl, and you look at the credits on the back, and it's all over the place. It's yeah. not just the artist. Yeah. The artist might not have written any songs on that <laughs> Yeah. And it's like uh, standards almost it's like everybody recorded a version of uh uh you know, like punch on left ear punch, yeah you know, exactly so. right yeah towns van zant's another one who who wrote all, all these great songs and were recorded by lots of different people well you know i said you know my, my dad is in that category of like everyone who was in the industry knew him you yeah. know they knew you know like the, he's in that like i said the towns van zant the 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 john prines yes you know all, all that kind of stuff that era of um, and actually, John Hartford, my dad was great friends with John Hartford. Was he really? I mean, there's a poster in my bathroom in Tahoe. My whole life has been a post John Hartford poster. You know, my dad, I know Detta, right? It was his wife and my, I mean, great, great friends uh, with wow. my dad. So it was. He's one of my favorites, like, of uh, all time. You know, but like you said, he's the, the unsung heroes of that stuff. You know, and obviously yeah. my dad was a little different because he had the the movies and he was a little more visual. You know, at one point he was definitely like a household name, you know, in the in the late eighties and stuff, you know, through the TV, TVs and, and, and radio. And, you know, he was the, he was the Bush beer guy, you know, when they had the, yeah. the Clydesdales going, you'd be like Bush beer, head <laughs> to the mountains, you know? So it's so funny. And, and that's one thing that I'm very lucky. Sometimes I can turn on the TV and even though my dad's been gone for 20 years, I can still see him sometimes, huh. you know, cause he's the dad in gremlins. So he's the one that started the whole thing. You know, he bought the, <laughs> bought the Mogwai and started the whole thing, you know, and he was in a bunch of movies and he was, you know, like I said, on every show back in the seventies and eighties, he was on at least one, you know, cameo one some time. Kind. So yeah, exactly. Like, Oh, he was always, he was always either like the, the sheriff or like the dad, you know, the heartfelt dad or, you know, the country bumpkin guy or, or play himself, you know, and Dukes of Hazzard, they, <laughs> did a joke where like they pulled his tour bus over and they made him play a show it was like his <laughs> payment for like getting pulled over you know so you know it's like i said I, i'm lucky for that i can still see him he's still alive in a lot of yeah in a lot of ways you know and, and music is the other way i get to keep him alive you know and it's been great down here because every time i play a show you know last night i played a show this place in maui sugar mill out in tarzana and he's got to do a little country set and, you yeah. know I, I usually do more americana rock stuff right or whatever singer songwriter stuff but i got to do a little country set and, you know, a couple of, like, the old timers that were in there came up afterwards, like, I remember seeing your dad back. And, you know, every show I played, there's always somebody's like, I remember in the 65, I saw him at the Golden Bear. And, like, you know, backstage, we sh- shared a cigarette. It was nice. It's got, you know, like, yeah. that stuff is really fuel. And it, it always, people always think I might, I get tired of it. They're like, isn't it annoying? I was like, no, it's the complete opposite. It is the best feeling to know that 
my dad not only musically but personally had a connection with somebody yeah. 60 years ago that meant something meant something and, and they still carry it you know that's absolutely it's, it's a beautiful thing and so so on, on the same sort of brag um now like i said down here that i've now i'm down here and sort of getting more on the professional you know train um we're actually working on a hoyt axton very early stages of a hoyt axton tribute album you know, because like like you said, there's a lot of songwriters that you know didn't really get the credit as artists, but they wrote a lot of great songs, right? They put a lot of bread on other people's table by writing good songs, yeah. you know. And so we're gonna do a tribute album, sort of pulling off like his hits and getting and and then doing an associated documentary about it. And so interviewing the people that were part of the music side of it, cool, you know. And so that's gonna it's all happening this year basically. So the last few months I've been just grinding on getting old stories and you know old videos and getting all these connections and stuff so it's great you know i mean it's it's awesome it's 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 a fun it's a fun grind you yeah know? you know and then, and then hopefully that can snowball into something a little a little bigger with the sort of accident legacy thing with my grandma and stuff like talking about that because i mean the reality is that they are part of the fabric of americana culture and stuff you know and um you know, especially like with my grandma, she was the only female in that industry. You yeah. know, and she fought and she, you know, she went she went to Congress and lobbied against like censorship laws and all this stuff back in the you know, like the fifties and sixties. You know, and like that stuff I didn't even know until I started like, you know, digging into this stuff. And yeah. You know, I mean there's there's just so many cool little things there. And like I said, I came later so I didn't get to really absorb that the same way, but now uh, you know it's my job to sort of bring that to light and and show off and and like I said, always centered around good music is the idea. You know, right. so so I'm, tr- I'm trying. I know that's a lot of bragging there, but at least Dude, it's true stories though. That's that, the fun. That part, all sounds right? incredible. <laughs> I can't wait to see it and hear the uh, tribute associated with it. Well, you never know. I mean, we we need some artists on there. You never know. I uh, I play you, a few you instruments. Know, hey, you know any country or people that play country too? <laughs> yeah. We'll talk after the, after yes, the exactly, recording yeah. here. Yes. <laughs> uh, so what what's what do we got here? Uh, one of your originals? Yeah, yeah. We'll do. I so said we'll keep the the Axton generation legacy train going. Um, like I said, this is this this one is mine. It's called Midnight Riders, not the the other song that's really famous with that same title, but but close, but. So basically the premise of this is one of the first songs I ever wrote. And the premise of it is, you know, the people that sort of ride through the night to, you know, play gigs or do their art, right, to push, right, is the idea. And I remember as a little kid, my dad's tour bus, which he he painted, he painted clouds on the side of it so that the cops could never catch him was the idea. <laughs> you know, this big old tour bus with this beautiful, like, cloudscape on the side. It worked, I think, you know. Or at least it was very noticeable. They knew who it was, you know, when yeah. mess with them, I guess. Um, but... You know, in those old tour buses, they had big pilot chairs up in the front, right? You know, there's the driver and then a big pilot chair. And then in the back, you know, the, the, well, nowadays they're a whole different world, right? They have the pullouts and they're like amazing. Yeah. But back then it had like a little ice, ice chest and then a bunch of bunks and then the, my dad's room in the back, right? But as a little kid, I remember I'd always like wake up in the middle of the night and I'd go like sneak up front. And sit in that big pilot chair and you know, watch the road go by and watch drive by these little towns and you know, sort of absorb that and listen to the only the age appropriate stories that I was allowed to, <laughs> definitely. Um, but you know, so this was my sort of ode to that the people, you know, the, that lifestyle, the people that you know did that for living and for love and for the music, right? So it's called Midnight Riders. Cool. <laughs> Sunset. 
sunset is growing wider Gets so lonely inside here Now I have become another midnight rider Remember in the days when true magic was made Run around for fun and play All those worries so far away But now they sit right by my side And there's no place to run and hide Cause when you start to mask the truth Is when it all falls down on you And sunset is growing wider And gets so lonely inside here Now I have become another midnight rider Where shining eyes they stare upon And feel the real words to their song And for one moment inside their life They can see just what it's like Satisfy those needs inside Clapping hands and working minds Warm smiles on cold, cold lives Is the real reason we ride And sunset is growing wider Gets so lonely inside here Now I have become another midnight rider Yeah, awesome man. That was awesome. What a great solo! It's oh, thank you. Yeah, very cool. So you're not just a bass player. No, no, uh, way more guitar player than bass player. It's just that like, there's not many. Nobody bass needs another guitar player, you know. <laughs> Especially in LA. That's why I just made the podcast. I was like, well, I'll never uh, run out of guests because I just <laughs> call up every guitar player I I know. Where can where can listeners uh, find you online? Uh, so, so madaxton.com is the thing now. Uh, you cool. know, I'm trying to make that sort of the the hub for Axton stuff. You know, and then we're, like I so said, we're we're starting all this Hoyt Axton. We're doing the whole blitz with all his stuff. You know, doing official things. It's it's going to be more centered around all these projects that are coming up, right? But Mad Axton Music on the inst- on Instagram and on Facebook and you know. I'm, Everywhere, everywhere, anywhere where you just type in Matt Axton. Although there is another Matt Axton out there in the universe somewhere. <laughs> I don't know if he's a musician, but uh, you can well, I'll, put, I'll put your info in the like, show notes. Good, yes, yeah. yes. And, and like I said, I'm trying to get all that stuff tight. And, you know, I realized down here it's about, you know, branding, branding and content. Yeah. You know, was, I've always been the guy who's like, I'd much rather sit on my porch with a guitar and write songs. If only that on paid the paid the bills. Exactly. So the hope is just get one <laughs> get one hit and then that will, you know. That's the yeah. idea. But well I appreciate uh coming out here and, and uh talking to me today and playing and 
It's been fun. We'll do it again sometime. Well, it's been great. Thank you for you know making my songs sound awesome like that. You know, great, great picking, man. That was fun. Thank you. All right, thanks, Matt. All right, adios.